Good evening, comrades and friends. Uh, my name is Carl Wood. Uh, I'm a retiree, retired out of the steel industry and the utility industry and a long time trade unionist and trade union leader. Uh, I also uh, have for many years been uh, leading classes and discussion groups, uh, particularly around political economy. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I've studied uh, some classic works of Marx and Lenin and uh, Engels, uh, including the subject of tonight's presentation, uh, which is one of the real classic works of uh, uh, coming from the, the great revolutionary leader and theoretician, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, the subject tonight of our presentation is Lenin's book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Uh, not a long book, and uh, in, uh, I always say things are an easy read. It's, uh, it's an easy read in a sense. Uh, it takes some study to really get out of it what you, what you can. But what I have found over the years is that uh, I've, I've reread this book probably about once every decade. And every time I read it, something that I really didn't pay a lot of attention to before jumps out at me. And I think this is one of the characteristics of a real classic, uh, is that it's written for the ages and not just for a particular moment in time. Uh, let me dive into uh, my presentation. Um, the, the capitalism that Marx spoke about and wrote about was characterized by what Lenin called free competition between manufacturers scattered and out of touch with one another and producing for an unknown market. The new form of capitalism, which, uh, took, uh, which took root in the years following Marx's death, monopoly capitalism, was just the opposite of this competition that uh, had characterized earlier capital capitalism. Lenin, building on the work of progressive bourgeois economists like Hobson, called this new stage imperialism. And that's what the name of the book comes from. It's long been noted that new social phenomena reveal themselves most clearly at their beginnings. And Lenin was able to sharply define what was new and important about this new stage of capitalism. Those of us who grew up knowing no other form of capitalism, and I think that includes everybody because you'd have to be uh, probably 150 years old to have known something else, uh, sometimes fail to see the significance of its distinctive features. This, for no other reason, is cause for us to study this classic work very carefully. In the short time available to us tonight, I'm going to try to summarize some of the chief features of Lenin's analysis and then bring up some things that have changed since the book was written. Uh, this book, Imperialism, was written from exile in Switzerland in the spring of 1916. That was before the breakout of the Russian Revolution. It was at the height of World War I. And uh, prior to the outbreak of hostilities uh, of World War I, Marxist socialists in all countries had declared their opposition to the impending imperialist war. If you were dressed to watch uh, documentaries on television, you would think that the cause of World War I was that a, uh, a Serbian nationalist assassinated Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, uh, and that caused the war. In fact, the war was long anticipated, uh, especially by those in the socialist movement. And uh, just two years before its outbreak, uh, at a world conference of socialist parties in Basel, Switzerland, a uh, declaration was issued that was signed by all of the socialist parties of the world uh, that said, and I'll quote, if a war breaks, threatens to break out, it's the duty of the working classes and their parliamentary representatives in the country involved, supported by the coordinating activity of the International Socialist Bureau to exert every effort in order to prevent the outbreak of war by the means they consider most effective. And then it goes on to say, if it should break out anyway, it's their duty to intervene in favor of its speedy termination 
uh, and with all their powers to utilize the economic and political crisis created by the war to arouse the people and thereby hasten the downfall of capitalist class rule. That was subscribed to by all of the socialist parties of the world. But when the war broke out, leaders of most of the socialist parties uh, conveniently found reasons to support their own bourgeois governments, becoming enablers thereby of the mass slaughter of workers of one country by workers of another in the world war. The pro-war propaganda at that time, such as the depiction of Kaiser Wilhelm as a savage brute, bears, at least in my mind, an eerie resemblance to the more recent pro-war campaigns by conservatives and liberals alike in our country and in other imperialist countries to portray imperialist war as a humanitarian campaign against so-called monsters like Saddam Hussein, the Taliban, and Bashar al-Assad. Uh, I, th I think it's a moment to reflect on the history of, of these tactics to justify war. The purpose of these, the purposes of this book were twofold. First, to explain the new form capitalism had taken since the time of Marx and Engels, to make it clear that imperialism is a stage of capitalism, not just a policy, and to expose the opportunistic betrayal of the what Lenin called the social social chauvinist leaders. That means socialist in deeds and. Uh, or socialist in words and chauvinist or nationalist or opportunist in deeds. Uh, in the first place, he called out Karl Kautsky, who uh, many people today perhaps don't uh, know or remember who he was, but he was widely viewed as the ideological heir to Marx and Engels. He was, I believe, uh, Engels' literary executor. Uh, he had been charged with uh, the responsibility of editing one of uh, Karl Marx's books and uh, was widely regarded as the defender of orthodox Marxism. But when the war broke out, Kautsky waffled. Uh, he regarded uh, in theoretically imperialism as a policy, uh, not a stage of capitalism, and therefore uh, believed that it was possible to have monopoly capitalism uh, that would not be imperialistic, that would not be aggressive, that would not seek the uh, conquest of other countries. It's important today because there are many liberals and so-called socialists who believe we can have capitalism without the warlike and anti-democratic tendencies of imperialism. Not that it is pointless and futile to work for peace and democracy under capitalism. We have to do that. But as long as we live under the rule of monopoly, we will always be faced with the twin dangers of war and reaction, uh, culminating uh, at times in fascism itself. Let me go through uh, the chief points of Lenin's book, and try to summarize and explain some of them. Uh, he starts out by saying that imperialism is the monopoly stage of capital, of capitalism. Uh, it represents a concentration of production and capital. If we follow this out, uh, it, it followed a similar pattern in all of the developed industrial countries. Uh, the one that uh, those of us uh, who are on the, the uh, webinar tonight might be most familiar with is the experience in the United States. In the United States, uh, from about the time of the Civil War, 1860, until the financial crisis of 1873, we had what you might refer to as the heyday of competitive capitalism. There was the bare beginnings of monopoly in a few industries, such as railroads, but in general, capitalism was highly competitive. Uh, it was characterized by relatively small enterprises and capitalists who acted independently of each other. From 1873 until the turn of the century, until 1900, we saw uh, the development and growth of monopolies. Uh, this happened very rapidly, although during that period of uh, almost 30 years, 27 or so years, uh, competition was still predominant. But by the late uh, 19th century, uh, and by uh, really by the year 1900, monopoly got the upper hand in the economy. And 
it happened uh, fairly suddenly and can be demarcated uh, by a number of events. 1900 marked the establishment of the first billion dollar corporation. That was the United States Steel Company, which uh, was put together when uh, Andrew Carnegie sold his holdings to J.P. Morgan. Morgan bought up some other steel companies and formed a giant steel monopoly that uh, controlled over half the steel production in the United States. Uh, Standard Oil, uh, under the uh, un under the ownership and domination of John D. Rockefeller, dominated the oil industry. And in industry after industry in that period of time, we saw the uh, building of cartels and then single companies or trusts that monopolized particular industries. Um, this process uh, continued even after the time of Lenin. Uh, in the late 20th century, we've seen intense intensified globalization and deregulation through the elimination of barriers to the free flow of capital. Uh, the types of monopoly arrangements uh, that Lenin described uh, were various at that time. He was writing in a particular historical moment. He identified cartels, uh, which were typical in certain industries. Uh, he mentions the cement industry, for example, where different uh, cement producers got together and divided up the market among themselves. A, a current example of a cartel would be OPEC, the oil pr uh, production companies or countries of the world that have divided up the, uh, the world markets. Uh, he also identifies syndicates, uh, which are another arrangement among various producers, and trusts, which are single companies that, uh, that control a particular industry. And those can be organized in various ways. They can be vertical trusts, which means uh, from raw materials to finished products, or they can be uh, horizontal trusts, which means uh, control of most or all of the uh, enterprises that operate a particular part of production, such as auto assembly, for example. Um, uh, we also have uh, monopolies today that uh, include companies from different industries. Those are called conglomerates. And we have transnationals of all sorts in different industries that don't just exist in a single country, but go to various countries, uh, sometimes all over the world. Uh, another characteristic of this new stage of, of capitalism is the merging of bank capital with industrial capital. Uh, under competitive capitalism, uh, banks had a limited role. They, they actually had two roles. Uh, one was to uh, provide credit to uh, industrial capitalists. And another for a different type of bank was to provide a place where people uh, of means could put their savings. Uh, under the uh, under the new system, the monopoly system that was emerging, the role, the role of banks changed. It was no longer just as an intermediary taking in money and then uh, paying it out, making payments. Now they uh, bring together the inactive capital of investors and savers and turn it into profit producing capital. Uh, along with this, we see a consolidation of banks and an increased monopolization to the point where when Lenin was writing, there were really two, uh, there, there were two major centers of banking one of which was built around the Rockefeller interests um, and the other was built around the Morgan interests. Uh, we saw the emergence now of a new phenomenon. Uh, that was the murder, that is the merger of uh, industrial capital. Uh, take a company, for example, like Standard Oil, which produced, uh, extracted and produced oil and, uh, and the banks. Um, Standard Oil established some banks uh, to service itself. Uh, I think that Chase Manhattan is an example of one of the Rockefeller banks. Uh, the Morgan interest went the other direction. They started out with banks and bought up industrial enterprises, uh, the steel industry, for example. The merger of these two types of capital, industrial capital and banking capital, Lenin called finance capital. 
And it was a very different thing because it gave a great deal more flexibility to the capitalists, to monopoly, uh, and uh, concentrated and strengthened the hand of monopoly. Uh, along with this was developed a financial oligarchy uh, about which uh, I probably don't have to say a whole lot. I think we're all fairly familiar with the existence of a financial oligarchy uh, in this country. If you're not familiar with it, uh, take a look at Donald Trump's cabinet. Uh, you'll realize who they are. Along with these developments in the organization of capital, we see now the uh, new phenomenon, relatively new phenomenon. Under competitive capitalism, international trade primarily consisted of the export of commodities from, uh, from countries that uh, manufactured uh, goods, uh, such as England was is the outstanding example uh, during the time of Karl Marx. Uh, and then imported raw materials and uh, or semi-finished goods from the other countries. Uh, now under imperialism, under monopoly capitalism, we see the export of capital, not just commodities, becoming very important because uh, the tremendous rise in profit and the profitability of these monopoly capitalist countries means they have a lot of extra money that they have to find some place to put to work. And they do this by exporting to the capital to other countries, uh, to underdeveloped countries, uh, sometimes to other developed countries. Uh, the British in the around the turn of that century, around 1900, uh, exported a lot of capital to the United States. Uh, the, uh, the Germans uh, exported capital. Uh, the French exported capital, and the United States uh, capitalists exported capital to other countries. Um, the uh, the superabundance of capital that it accumulated in the advanced countries uh, made free trade uh, much more important. Earlier uh, competitive capitalism tended to emphasize protection, tariff barriers to trade so that developed capitalist countries wouldn't have to compete with other developed capitalist countries. But the need to export capital to other countries gave rise to a great interest in uh, lowering tariff barriers uh, in order to facilitate trade. We also saw during this period of time the formation of international monopolies. Uh, we saw international cartels. Um, at the time that Lenin was writing, an outstanding cartel was that of uh, the electri electricity, electric equipment companies. Uh, there was General Electric in the United States. There was German General Electric in Germany. And between the two of them uh, and the patents that they controlled, uh, they divided up the entire world. Uh, the German company got part of the world. The American company got the other part of the world, and they didn't compete against each other uh, in any of those countries. Uh, it's sort of indicative to the level of their patriotism that this deal was actually honored while the two countries were at war with each other in World War I. Uh, the uh, American General Electric uh, set aside profits uh, that it made by using the German patents and after the war settled up with their former adversaries. Uh, we also see uh, the development, especially in more recent times, of transnationals. And uh, we see an increasing importance of patent protection of internet intellectual property. We see a lot of that in the newspapers today, but that was important even at the time that Lenin was writing. Uh, the example of, of the General Electric companies and their patents uh, is evidence of that. We also saw the territorial division of the world among the great powers. Uh, at, uh, at the time of the US Civil War, for example, uh, large parts of the world um, were not developed in the capitalist uh, in, in the capitalist economy, but also were not dominated by European colonial powers. Uh, however, with the development of monopoly capitalism and the, the growth of, of the political power of the monopolies, 
colonialism became more and more important to the point that by the turn of the century, virtually the entire world had been divided up among the great uh, the great powers of Europe primarily, and, and to a lesser degree, Japan. Uh, we also saw the phenomenon that we now call neocolonialism, which was the form that most of the United States colonialism took, which is the indirect control of other countries. Uh, we exercised, our country exercised uh, economic control through indirect political control, for example, of most of the Western Hemisphere. And along with all of this, because there's only one world to divide it up, and uh, some of the growing and expanding powers felt they had been shortchanged in the division of uh, all of this uh, property, which they regarded as something that was open game, even though people already lived in those places. Uh, we saw rises of tendency towards war in the first place between capitalist powers. Uh, and then uh, along with that, the suppression of national independence and social change. Uh, this tendency to war was uh, realized and culminated. Uh, of course, it had been seen before World War I. Uh, wars like the Boer War, the Spanish-American War uh, were examples of uh, colonial wars. but. Uh, World War I was really uh, a giant feud between two coalitions of uh, capitalist countries over control of the rest of the world. Lenin also described imperialism as parasitic and decaying capitalism. Uh, he pointed out that there is a tendency uh, under monopoly capitalism, under imperialism, to retard the growth of productive forces. Whereas capitalism uh, in a, not in a moral sense or in a political sense, but in a uh, technological and economic sense uh, is a progressive force in its early uh, iterations as a competitive force. Uh, tendencies to retard the growth of the production productive forces start to come to the fore under monopoly. Uh, one example of this is monopoly subversion of the competitive market. Uh, as competition is suppressed by monopolies, then the uh, technological development uh, and the productivity development that goes along with that is also suppressed. So we see the holding back of new technologies. Uh, when technologies are developed that would be disruptive, uh, there is a tendency to try to suppress them. The efforts to suppress them are not always successful, uh, and ultimately things tend to uh, push forward. But there's always the tendency to uh, retard the growth of new things. Uh, there are barriers to the free flow of information and technology, uh, particularly through the use of uh, patents and commercial secrecy. Uh, we see the suppression of possibly superior technologies in order to reinforce the uh, monopoly position of uh, incumbent monopolies. Uh, an example of this, and I don't claim to any great uh, technological uh, sophistication with regard to computers, but the feud between uh, Apple and Microsoft uh, systems, for example, uh, it's not clear that either either of them is uh, particularly superior or outstanding. Uh, there are likely other uh, other forms of organizing uh, computers that could be more efficient. But because of the uh, control of the market, because of control of patents, uh, because of uh, anti-competitive practices, uh, we have very limited type of actual competition between different uh, platforms and formats. Uh, we see uh, an emphasis on production for profit, not for use. Uh, under competitive capitalism, uh, capitalists tend to try to cater to the desires and wants of consumers, if only because uh, that's how they sell products. Uh, under imperialism, under monopoly, uh, the monopolists attempt to uh, shape the market themselves 
rather than respond to it. And uh, in order to make sure that they are producing things that will be the most profitable. Uh, we also see an increase in non-productive workers, such as bureaucracy, the military, and uh, um, certain types of, of personal services. Uh, and maybe most importantly, uh, we see the growth and in institutionalization of militarism. Uh, the United States, for example, uh, didn't really have a standing army of any size prior to the emergence of imperialism. Uh, look at what we, ha what we have now. Uh, we also see the growth of a section of the rich that are divorced completely from the productive process. Uh, there, over the years, there have been various uh, terms used for that, the idle rich or the jet set, and they've been, uh, or trustafarians, uh, they've been personified sometimes back in the 30s. It was uh, Pearl Mesta, who was the heiress to a uh, giant uh, industrial fortune, who gave parties. That was her life. She gave parties around Washington, D.C. Uh, Paris Hilton uh, is famous for some of, the, some of the same reasons, among other things. Uh, we also see the development of political reaction. Uh, an intensified use of racism, anti-communism, and uh, in more recent years, anti-terrorism, so-called. Uh, we see an ongoing attack on labor rights, uh, re regressive taxation, uh, monopoly control of media. media. Um, all of these things that I'm mentioning, uh, you just have to pick up a newspaper and you see them, although they're things that uh, were talked about 100 years ago when Lenin was writing. We see the degradation of popular culture, the glorification of violence, uh, uh, pornography that uh, victimizes women in particular, um, uh, a topic of the day, uh, but it's not new, official lawlessness, uh, Watergate, Iran-Contra, the theft of the 2000 election, uh, the Bush and Ashcroft assault on the Bill of Rights, and uh, in my notes I have Trump, exclamation mark, uh, enough said. Uh, war is used as a tool for domestic distraction and repression, and ultimately monopoly resorts uh, to the most extreme measures uh, politically which are fascism. Uh, that's the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary and chauvinistic and warlike sections of monopoly capital. But Lenin said that imperialism is actually capitalism that is ripe for the, and ready for the transition to socialism. It creates the material prerequisites for socialism. Uh, it sharpens the contradictions of capitalism and uh, because of the law of uneven economic and political development, that is that not all, not all economies, not all countries develop at the same rate of speed, uh, you see conflicts and instabilities that are constantly being created. Uh, this produces what we refer to as the general crisis of capitalism. Uh, there is a new development that emerges at the time that Lenin is writing, which is what we call state monopoly capitalism. That is monopoly capitalism characterized by a fusion of the power of monopoly capital with that of the state. Uh, the use of state levers for stimulating monopoly concentra concentration of production and capital, uh, the revolving door between business and government, business activities of the state, state economic regulation and militarization of the economy. These are all things that we completely take for granted today, and uh, in a lot of ways, they're hardly remarkable. And yet, uh, at the time that Lenin was writing, they were mostly new, and that is part of the significance of this uh, remarkable book by Lenin, is that he identified these features as they were emerging uh, that would later come to characterize the new stage of capitalism. However, uh, Lenin couldn't anticipate everything that would happen. Um, and as Marxists, we don't believe that it's possible for anybody to do that. Uh, we would be foolish, I think, to believe that we're going to get the answers to everything in a book that's over 100 years old. 
there are new features of imperialism today that I think have to be looked at, taken into consideration, and responded to. Uh, one important thing, two important things really, is that since Lenin's time, the economy has undergone at least two technological revolutions. Uh, the automation revolution, in which uh, uh, not only machinery was used, but automatic machinery that tended to uh, uh, relieve the necessity for uh, much manual labor, but also displaced uh, workers in a lot of cases. And then the computer or cybernation uh, revolution, uh, which is still going on. Uh, those two things have really transformed the very nature of production. Uh, we have factories that require no human beings whatsoever. Uh, that really changes the nature of production. Uh, in Lenin's time, uh, agriculture was still the most backward section of the economy. However, uh, although Lenin wrote that agriculture lags behind industry everywhere, that's changed. Uh, the, in the United States, for example, at the time that Lenin was writing, the majority of the U.S. population was still rural and largely involved in the agricultural economy. Today, the agricultural economy is a very, involves a very small percentage of the population, although it still is uh, much more highly productive than it's ever been before. Uh, we have seen a transformation of the U.S. population from rural to almost entirely urban and suburban. Uh, along with that, in less developed but developing countries, uh, Mexico, for example, we see uh, that under monopoly capitalism, there is a disruption of the traditional or at least the existing uh, agricultural arrangements. Uh, the institution of uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was tremendously disruptive of Mexico's agriculture, driving uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people off the land because they couldn't compete with uh, cheap industrially produced uh, imports from the United States uh, or, or with uh, advanced agriculture that was subsidized by uh, U.S. investments. Um, we see a, a much greater role of patents and commercial secrecy in creating and maintaining monopolies. Uh, Apple, I believe, is now the, uh, the most highly capitalized, the, the richest company in the world. Uh, and yet, what does it consist of but a bunch of patents? Uh, sure, it has production facilities, most of which it farms out. But at its core, uh, Apple is a bunch of patents, and in that way, it's not unique. It's typical of many, many countries or companies. Uh, we see, uh, while uh, since the beginning of imperialism, the export of capital uh, became important and characteristic, we now see the instantaneous mobility of capital. Uh, if you want to use, if you want to move a billion dollars from one place in the world to another, you press a button on a computer and it happens. Uh, that was not the case at the time that Lenin was writing, and it's really changed an awful lot because compare that with the relatively uh, slower mobility of workers. Capital can move to wherever it can get the cheapest labor and the most favorable economic and political treatment. Workers can't. Uh, workers may not even get to some place that they want to get to because of uh, barriers that uh, prohibit or impede uh, or disadvantage uh, emigration. We see the globalization of production processes. Uh, take cars, for example. Uh, cars may be uh, that we call American made might be assembled in some state in the United States, and yet the parts come from all over the place, all over the world, in fact. Uh, maybe the most extreme example are uh, cell phones. iPhones uh, are uh, put together with components that are manufactured in dozens and dozens of countries around the world. Uh, 
we see the increased proletarianization of non-production workers, uh, commercial workers, for example, uh, transport workers, workers involved in circulation, uh, warehousing, uh, and uh, advertising. Uh, all of these are areas that Marxists have uh, historically regarded as non-productive, and yet, in the context of the current uh, the current economy, the new economy, uh, there are essential aspects to the production process, and along with their uh, this essential nature, uh, it's also meant that the workers in these industries uh, become increasingly proletarian, uh, wage workers rather than uh, other types of workers uh, that workers in those sectors were in earlier days. Formal colonialism is mostly gone, but rivalries between imperialist powers continue and can still lead to war. Uh, you don't have to look very far to see that happening right now. Uh, the uh, US administration is uh, itching to find a way to get into a war, uh, full-blown war. We're already heavily involved in Syria, for example. Uh, the US is deeply involved in Iraq and Afghanistan and other parts of, uh, of the world. And uh, if you think that we're involved in those places to defend democracy, then I pity your naivete. Uh, we are there to, or the United States and our, and the United States Armed Forces are there in order to protect and advance the interests of U.S. monopoly capital to uh, control and have influence over those parts of the world. On the bright side, uh, I would observe that the mass struggles of the 20th century for national liberation and for racial equality especially have altered the ideological landscapes uh, very profoundly in ways that are incompatible with materialism or with imperialism. This process has also broadened and enriched the humanism that has always characterized Marxism, uh, bringing new forces into the anti-capitalist struggle. Uh, the struggle for women's equality has always been a key aspect of Marxist ideology and of progressive politics generally, but it's raised to a new level. Uh, the emergence of the LBGTQ uh, struggles uh, as a uh, widely recognized mass struggle is a new development, but I think it flows out of the same type of humanism uh, that uh, has been given a push by these uh, struggles of the last century. Um, wrapping up, I would uh, I would just quote uh, Lenin's uh, conclusion from all of this. He said that state monopoly capitalism is a complete material preparation for socialism, the threshold of socialism, a rung on the ladder of history between which and the rung called so socialism, there are no intermediate rungs, uh, end quote. Uh, I think that's, uh, it's a true observation, but it should also be a source of great uh, hope and optimism for us. Uh, we aren't there yet. We do not have socialism throughout the world. We have uh, various degrees of socialism in some countries of the world. Uh, but there's a lot of fight to go before we uh, realize our ultimate goal. But economically, uh, capitalism has created the material preconditions for socialism. Uh, all we need now are the political preconditions, uh, and we will get there. With that, I'd like to uh, wrap up my part of the presentation and open the floor to uh, comments and questions that people may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carl. If you, those in, uh, participants, if you have a comment or question, please use your raised hand icon to indicate that you want to speak. Just click the hand uh, with your mouse to indicate that you want to speak and we will uh, go to your mic and open it. So I'm looking through the listing. Okay. 
Gonzalo, your mic is open. Gonzalo Vergara, your mic is open. Esther, your mic is open. Esther, your mic is open. Well, I, I don't have a question exactly. I just find uh, the discussion very good. Um, and I guess more people should be talking about it. Um, Uh, especially the, I thought it was interesting, the various changes uh, that have taken place since Lenin um, that deepen his predictions in a way. Uh, he was, he was smart. <laughs> so um, I hope this is going to be online. That's it. You mean you hope there will be a recording? Yes. Yes, there will be. Good. Emil, your mic is open. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, there's Emil here in Virginia. Uh, absolutely wonderful, marvelous presentation. Uh, thank you so much for this. It was, it was so succinct and so so uh, so well done uh i would be interested knowing if you if if possible how you see the current uh, back and forth about tariffs between trump and other countries uh in the light of uh, the economic side of uh, imperialism that's all hey, why don't i address each question at the end so we can take all of them. Mark, your mic is open. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Carl. Um, so some might say, well, OK, so the US is an imperialist power and does all these things around the world on behalf of US corporations. But that means I can buy bananas and mangoes in the supermarket year round at low prices and uh, get incredibly cheap electronics goodies. And uh, generally that uh, I don't have to worry about lots of things people in other countries have to worry about because there's no superpower that's going to push me around. So, uh, so what's wrong with imperialism? Anthony, your mic is open. Anthony, your mic is open. Yes, uh, Mr. Wood, that was a great presentation. Does anything that you said concerning uh, Lenin or Karl Marx or Engels' uh, thoughts connect with the Roman Empire? And if you, if you'll forgive me for going back in history that far. I'm a former I'm a former uh, college history professor, and uh, that that just kept crossing my mind. I mean, is is everything that Karl Marx and others connected with the Communist Party? Uh, wrote about and thought about connected more with the uh, industrial age and forward, or is there some connection with the Roman Empire, if you're familiar with the Roman Empire uh, history, and of course, sadly, the fall. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Do we have more questions? Yes. 
Frank uh, Fragano, your mic is open. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've had, I, I wrote a number of questions down. I think I post I posted those while the presentation was going on. I think this is one of the best presentations on the subject I've heard in years. Uh, but I also think that when we go back and we look at Lenin on imperialism, and we consider that capitalism has survived rather better than Lenin expected or than we expected um, in the years when there was an allegedly Leninist power in the world, um, we're looking at it backwards. We live in a world today where we have the resources to give every single human being an adequate standard of living. Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we working for that rather than rehashing Lenin's, Lenin's critique of the world that was about to crash into the, that was, had crashed itself into the First World War? Because I think it, it is central to any attempt to analyze the world today that we consider that right now we could redistribute the resources of the world so that every single human being could, would, would not starve and would not only not starve but would be able to have a comfortable life from, from birth to death and a long life for that. Anyway, I better stop because I'm, because I'm ranting and this gets me very angry. Thank you. few more. Ishmael, your mic is open. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, my question, hello, Carl, the uh, presentation was excellent. Uh, in your depiction of the uh, uh, indicating that World War I was a division for among the uh, developing capitalist countries for the rest of the world's natural resources, can you apply uh, Lenin's uh, analysis to what is currently happening with regard to uh, the world and specifically all that is happening in the Middle East? Uh, and secondly, uh, how does this analysis apply to the question of uh, entire world populations now moving as a result uh, of capitalism and immigration? And how this, you know, of course, uh, the the uh, the fights that we have here in this country against the uh, the uh, nativism and against the the question of immigration. Thank you. A few more. Lowell, your mic is open. Carl, aloha. This is uh, Lowell calling from Hawaii. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, the last caller actually beat me to the question about World War I, so I hope you touch on that. My question is, given your extensive knowledge, um, there's a continuous debate among the, let's call it the radical left, whether China today is socialist or not. I happen to think, given what it's doing in Africa, it's not, but there are people on the radical left who look at the same things China is doing in Africa, and they call it socialist. Um, the railroads, the um, extraction of uh, mineral and uh, resource wealth, et cetera. Um, given the topic today about imperialism, what's your opinion um, about China in general? And do you think China has latched on to the tail end of this last stage of capitalism? and become essentially an imperialist country in terms of what it's doing, in, um, especially in Africa. Thank you. I think there are a couple more. Um, is that Michael? Michael? Yeah. OK. Okay, so thank you very much for this presentation, and uh, I was just talking to my comrade Anita Waters up in Columbus, and we both really enjoyed it. Um, going off a little bit of Lowell's question, what you kind of said at the end to wrap up, 
uh, your statements about the current state of imperialism and how the United States is constantly, you know, especially under the Trump administration on the brink of war with North Korea, Iran, and China. And I wouldn't class me personally, I wouldn't classify Iran and North Korea under, or per se under uh, imperialist governments, right? But we all know about the Tibet situation in China. And so, you know, would we consider China, you know, one of these imperialist powers? you know, that's up to face the United States. And if we think about the, the recent hurricanes that we saw in, in Puerto Rico and how the, the lack of relief effort, you know, that we saw in Puerto Rico, is that also an example of modern uh, imperialism? Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Carl, why don't you treat whatever questions you're going to treat. There are several other uh, hands raised, but we're kind of running out of time. I, I apologize. Okay. Uh, great questions, all of them. Uh, and I will try to address them all as uh, I, my notes are kind of sketchy, so I hope I capture the essence of them. Uh, Emil asked about uh, tariffs and I guess the tariff war that it seems to be beginning right now. Um, under, uh, under classical, uh, uh, capitalism, the uh, capitalism of Marx's time, uh, we tended to see a lot of protectionism, which meant uh, that countries would create tariff barriers in order to protect their uh, economies against uh, competition from other countries. And with the emergence of and development of imperialism, uh, we tended to see the uh, uh, promotion in a lot of cases of uh, free trade and the liquidation of tariff barriers because tariff barriers uh, are in large part an impediment to the operation of monopoly com companies. But uh, all these general rules have exceptions and uh, things change and different groups of imperialists come to power in different countries. And I think part of what's going on right now is that the current administration, the Trump administration, represents uh, parts of the of the capitalist class that feels that they will benefit by uh, creating trade barriers uh, with, to their competitors. And the implications of that are that other countries uh, will create trade barriers to things that the United States has to sell. And we are liable to see the development of a trade war. Uh, this has happened before. It happened uh, prior to the Great Depression, uh, where there uh, was something of a, of a trade war. Um, I don't know that, uh, that tariffs uh, are necessarily a characteristic of uh, capitalism or imperialism at any particular time. I think that uh, this is uh, a matter of uh, struggle between different groups of capitalists uh, and imperialists. Um, the, the real danger, of course, is that it leads to greater instability in the economic system and instability that could lead to an economic crash could be catastrophic. Uh, not just to the capitalists, but in particular to the working class, to the ordinary people of the world. Uh, so it's a matter of considerable concern. Uh, I, I think that uh, in a world that is not dominated by imperialism, uh, and we saw that at the time that there was a larger socialist community of nations, uh, we saw trading zones among the socialist countries, in which countries did not take advantage of each other, but rather traded on a more fair basis. And I think that's something that we can look forward to when we have socialism. But in the meantime, we're gonna be seeing these trade uh, uh, wars and tariffs uh, develop and come and go uh, according to the politics and economics of the moment. Um, Art asked a question about US consumers getting benefits from trade. Well, of course they do, but uh, I don't think that's any thanks to the capitalist system. I think that's uh, just due to the fact that modern technology has enabled us to move goods uh, easily and relatively cheaply from one place to another. Uh, and uh, in places where you can't grow bananas, you can import bananas. Uh, 
and um, I think that's going to continue regardless of what kind of socioeconomic system you have. The real question is how is that organized uh, and for whose benefit? Is it going to be organized in a way that results in the greatest profit for monopoly corporations? Or is it going to be made to uh, have these goods and services available to everybody at reasonable prices? And I think the key to doing that is getting rid of uh, capitalist incentives and uh, have a society and economy that works for everybody. Um, Anthony asked a question about how all this connects with the Roman Empire, uh, which maybe is particularly pertinent because of the name of the uh, of this session, which is imperialism, and we associate imperialism with uh, the most famous of the empires, which was the Roman Empire. I think the answer is that uh, in form, uh, the imperialism of today uh, bears some resemblance uh, to uh, imperialism of earlier epochs, uh, including the Roman Empire, uh, a centralized uh, government that dominates uh, countries outside of its own territories uh, and uh, repressive regimes and so forth. But I think it would be uh, superficial to carry that too far because the essence of what a society is all about is ultimately going to be determined by uh, the way in which the goods and services that are required by people to live are produced and exchanged. And that is very different from the uh, much more primitive uh, economy and technology that existed at the Roman under the Roman Empire and the uh, technology and the uh, economy that we have today, uh, in not just in the United States, but frankly, in every country of the world, even the less developed parts of the world. Um, then his other question was, why aren't we focused on providing a decent standards of living for everyone? Well, we are, uh, but the barriers to that are not simply that uh, we haven't figured out how to divide everything up among everybody. Uh, the reason that we don't have a fair distribution of all the goods and services we need uh, are those are political reasons. Uh, we have a political system which protects and defend, it defends the interests of the ultra rich at the expense of everybody else. And as long as we have a political system which is controlled by the uh, monopolies and their owners, uh, then we're not going to have an equitable distribution of the wealth of society. Uh, so what we're faced with is not just a matter of figuring out how to equitably distribute things. It's a matter of uh, changing the political system so that we are enabled to have that kind of equitable distribution. And that's why the question of socialism uh, uh, the, the production and distribution questions, the technical parts of it, they've already been solved. Uh, the capitalists have done that for us. Uh, you know, um, if if we need to find something to get something, uh, we can go online and get it through Amazon. The problem is that it's all based on a profit-making system, which advantages certain classes of people, uh, an increasingly small number of people, at the expense of everybody else. Uh, Ismail. Uh, asked about the uh, division of natural resources and, uh, and how does that apply today? Well, I, I think uh, the issues are still out there. Uh, the imperialist countries and the monopolies that uh, occupy them and that uh, control their governments are still interested, uh, vitally interested in dominating uh, portions of the world in one way or another, whether not so much in the traditional colonialist manner of having a colonial army that occupies, although uh, I'm not sure how else you would describe the US occupation, for example, of uh, Afghanistan for the last couple of decades. But uh, I, th I think that uh, the real key thing to understand here is that is that imperialism gives rise to uh, these imperialist wars uh, that aim at the uh, at the political and ultimately economic domination of other parts of the world, and that's why it is so important in order to address the danger of war to uh, attack 
uh, imperialism at its at its core, at its heart. Uh, the challenges of immigration are uh, all flow out of the uh, this imperialist system, and uh, we can't really resolve the questions of uh, immigration in a single country. Uh, we can do a lot of things. We could make the treatment of immigrants in the United States much more humane uh, rather than persecuting and uh, deporting people right and left. But ultimately, uh, we have to have an economic system in which uh, it's possible for people, if they so desire, to stay in the countries in which they uh, were born and uh, and lead a de decent life, have a decent living, uh, rather than being forced for economic reasons or for political persecution that comes out of uh, the economic systems in those countries, uh, uh, forcing those people to leave their own countries and try to figure out some way to get into one of the more advanced capitalist countries. Um, Lowell asked the question, is China socialist or not? And I think the answer to that has to be, it's a mixed answer. Uh, and I think that's not a settled matter yet. Uh, China had a profound revolution uh, that culminated in the victory of the communists in 1949 and uh, set out on the construction of socialism. And it was by fits and starts. They made, they had some tremendous gains and they made some tremendous errors as well along the way. And at a certain point, uh, there was a decision uh, made, uh, although I, I think it, it actually has its roots at the time of the uh, success of the Chinese revolution, to allow the existence, the continued existence of a capitalist class in China, but have it under the, uh, uh, under the thumb, so to speak, of a workers' government, of a communist government. Uh, whether that has been successful or not uh, is not just open to debate, but it's probably still up in the air. Uh, clearly, there has been the development of uh, a capitalist class, uh, including a class of very large capitalists. We could refer to them as monopoly capitalists. I think by the time you're a billionaire, you qualify as a monopolist. Uh, and Inevitably, they have political influence, although it appears that the Communist Party is still uh, by far the dominant political structure in China. Uh, and I think, uh, from all I can tell, the Communist Party retains a commitment ultimately to build a socialist uh, society there. But whether that uh, situation of, a, uh, of an economy that has an important capitalist class can continue to coexist with a uh, with with a uh, government that is led by a party that proclaims its uh, uh, allegiance to the working class. Uh, I think that remains to be seen. Uh, it's going to be the result of uh, struggles, both ideological and maybe in other forms that are yet to come. Uh, in the meantime. Uh, I think we should be looking at giving China as much uh, political and economic space as possible to allow for peaceful development of their economy and their society there, rather than going along with the Trump administration's uh, push for economic war. And uh, and it's not just Trump alone. I mean, it, this includes uh, representatives of the capitalist class all the way over to liberal Democrats who are hostile towards China. And uh, I think uh, that should not be our role. Uh, we should not see China as an enemy, uh, but rather uh, as a country that is trying to find its own path for development. Um, Michael uh, also asked about uh, about China and uh, um, and brought up Iran and. Uh, and I thought he said North Korea. I'm not sure if he was talking about South Korea or if I misheard it. Uh, uh, Iran and South Korea certainly are, uh, are capitalist countries, um, but uh, they are capitalist countries with their own nationalistic agendas, uh, which do not always uh, 
correspond uh, to that of the United States or the other Western powers like Britain and France and Germany. Um, I think the key thing for us is not to be telling people in those countries how they should live their lives, but rather uh, to do everything we can to keep our own country and our own uh, government from interfering with the right of those countries to develop in accordance to the wishes of their own people rather than uh, the dictates of U.S. monopoly capitalism. Uh, and uh, the mention of Puerto Rico is just, uh, you know, it, it's a real indication of how uh, colonialism uh, uh, still lives today. It's uh, the U.S. Uh, outrageously and obscenely maintains Puerto Rico effectively as a colony of the United States and uh, has only used it to suck out its natural and human resources. Uh, and when the, the island, when the country was faced with uh, natural catastrophe, uh, the response of the U.S. government has been worse than pathetic. Uh, it's, uh, it's another example of where the solidarity of the entire working class of the United States and the working class around the world with the people of Puerto Rico is an absolute necessity uh, for humanitarian reasons as well as to uh, prevent further political problems. Anyway, I hope that I've given some kind of response to the questions that were asked. I really appreciate the involvement and participation of all of you and uh, uh, look forward to meeting uh, some of you that I haven't met before and uh, having further discussions about these matters. That's it for, uh, for me tonight. Thank you.